All right. Good evening, everyone. It is so good to be here with you all, and uh, sure do appreciate seeing everyone here and looking forward to our study tonight. Um, as usual, let's go ahead and, and start off our study with a word of prayer. Our God, we come to you now uh, with minds that are willing to learn and hearts that are open to your word, and we are so grateful for the opportunity that we have to uh, study your word. We're so grateful that you've given us the scriptures and uh, that they are holy and infallible and that they are without error. We are so grateful to you, O oh God, for being so gracious to us and for being patient with us and bringing in us as your own. Uh, thank you so much for considering us as children. Uh, Father, we love you and we appreciate how you take care of us and how you lead us. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. All right, so this is our last class, not this quarter, but our last class in Ephesians. Um, so just kind of a way of review that we walked through Ephesians chapter 1, if you remember looking through there, and no, I don't have my iPad tonight, um, and that was partially on purpose. I want a little bit more feedback from you, um, so we're going to go away with that just for tonight, probably pick it back up next week. Uh, but Ephesians chapter 1, we looked at the phrase that goes all the way through, in Jesus, or in Him. And Ephesians 1 really tells us of the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. Uh, this was going to be something pretty monumental for the people that Paul is writing to as a Gentile audience, primarily, and then secondary audiences after that. Um, but these Gentiles, they didn't really know God other than the Jews and what the Jews had prescribed to them. And so uh, they are now brought into God's family. They are faithful in Christ. Notice how Paul says in chapter 1 and verse 1, uh, to the saint, to our Ephesus, who are faithful in Christ. And he's going to uh, go through and, and talk about all those different spiritual blessings that they have. Uh, and then he's going to remind them of the hope of their calling. And then chapter 2, uh, we talked about how God's family is made up of everyone, that everyone around the world. And I brought up the illustration of the word hallelujah and how you can transcend that word into many different cultures and how that word remains transliterated, hallelujah. Um, it doesn't matter what language. And so that really is a point to show that in any culture, in any part of the world, that people are part of God's family. Uh, and so when we look at chapter 2, Paul is going to hit on that a little bit. And then Paul is also going to, in chapter 2, bring up three different, what I would consider to be, pauses in one's spiritual journey. Um, so a pause in a spiritual journey is look at chapter 2 and verse 3. He says, among whom we all also formally conduct ourselves in the lust of our flesh, uh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Verse 4, but God. Uh, we see that same phrasing in verse 13. and verse 12, Paul would say, remember that you were at that time without Christ. You were alienated from the citizenship of Israel. You were strangers to the covenant of the promise. You had no hope, and you had no God in the world. Uh, and then verse 13, it says, but now in Christ Jesus, you formerly, you who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And then when you look at chapter 2, in verse 19, he says, so then you are no longer strangers and sojourners, but you are fellow citizens. And so in chapter 2, we see that those old ways of walking have been done away with. And then in chapter 3, we started to kind of change gears a little bit into more of the practical side of Paul's letter in Ephesians. Um, in chapter 3, he's going to talk about how we are to be uh, those who are living um, with Christ. Uh, look at verse 14. This is where Paul brings in his second prayer. He says, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father. And he would ask that they would be strengthened, uh, especially through the power of, the, of God's Spirit in the inner man. And then chapter 4, 5, and 6, as I described earlier, are more of the practical chapters of Ephesians. And this is pretty normal for Paul's letters, at least for his uh, short letters or epistles, um, he's going to spend the last part of the letter talking about practicality. And he introduces that in chapter 4 and verse 1. He says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, exhort you to walk worthy of the calling with which you have been called. So Paul is going to invoke an action among the people that they are to take everything that they've learned up to this point, that they are brought into Christ, that they have these spiritual blessings, and now live that out. You've been saved by the gospel. You have the good news. So how does that translate in one's life? And last week, we, we really talked about how can I be a tool in God's service? How can God work through me 
uh, primarily, number one, for the body of Christ, how can I effectively show my skills and show my characteristics that I've gained through Christ to the body of Christ? But then secondarily, how can I show that to the world? Um, so we're going to kind of pick up there tonight and talk through uh, the rest of Ephesians chapter 4. We left off, um, I believe, right around 22. And then we're going to go through chapter 5 and chapter 6 tonight. And then next week, we'll pick up in Philippians. Um, so that's kind of the itinerary tonight. Um, what I wanted to do is kind of break this cl class up into two different sessions. I think that there's two threads following through uh, chapter 4, 5, and 6. Obviously, there are many more threads, and that's like the theme of a book. There can be multifaceted themes, um, but they can be right themes. And so uh, these are not the primary. I don't want you to be mistaken. These are not the primary threads in Ephesians, but I think that they're there uh, and that they should catch our attention at least to some regard. Again, the first class I preface this as this is not an academic class necessarily. This is not looking at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 1 and saying, well, the Greek word for Ephesus is not found in Codex Sinaiticus or Alexandrius, but it is found in this other codex. So we're not going to go textual criticism with it. We're really just trying to get back to God's word, to scripture, and look at what does God's word have for me on this Wednesday, this midweek break, and how can I live this out tomorrow? So that's what we're going to try and do uh, kind of following the rest of this class. So um, to start with, I, I wanted to open it up for some discussion and ask you a question and that is, how would you describe Christ? What are some words that come to mind when you first think about Jesus? Because Paul has spent a lot of his time in Ephesians 1, 2, 3, and 4 talking about who Christ is, what Christ has done for us, and then we're going to kind of shift that a little bit. But I want to leave it to you. Who is Christ as you read through the Gospels, as you've experienced life and forgiveness and sanctification? Who is Christ? What are some words that come to your mind? Savior, which would imply that we were lost or that we were uh, dying. Lord. And I think that one is very important in today's society. We struggle with an authority problem. Um, you could go into the, the school system and see that kids struggle with authority. Adults struggle with authority. And this word for Lord oftentimes gets used synonymously with God, and I think rightfully so in some aspect, but Lord is really talking about a master, someone who lords over you, someone who you go to for commands. Um, so Lord is not simply just lost in this religious ambiguity, but it is this word that identifies that you have an authority figure and that you are not king over you, but Jesus is Lord over you. What other word comes to mind when you think of Jesus? The Christ. The Christ, yep. So we've got uh, the chosen one or uh, the anointed one. Compassion. compassion. Absolutely. When you get to Luke, Justice, we'll see compassion really be brought out in that gospel. But Jesus is one who never took for granted an opportunity to show compassion. Whenever he saw someone in need, he was always willing to extend compassion. And he did so for us as well. What else do you see in Christ? Okay. What else? Master. 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 Kind of carries on with Lord. Trustworthy. trustworthy. Absolutely. I wish more people would see Jesus as trustworthy. Okay, creator, tap it into some John 1 and Colossians 1. Brother. brother, yep. Hebrews identifies Jesus as our brother. He says he's not ashamed to call us his brothers. Selfless. Selfless. Yep, he bought us back. We sold ourselves, and Jesus brought us back to God. Servant, yep, Mark chapter 10, verse 45. He is a servant. I heard two, so I'll write them both down. Teacher, or rabbi, as many would call him. He is also holy. Okay, truth, yep, I'll put that with trustworthy. He's got truth. What was that? Relatable. 
Relatable? Yeah, love? Yeah, and that's actually a really cool word. You can't blame Jesus for anything. Um, there's, there's no blame, there's no guilt found in him. So when you look to him, he's, he's totally blameless. Humble. All right, one more. Yeah. Isaiah 52 and 53 talk about that that he suffered for us, and then that came to fruition, especially on the cross. But um, it's definitely interesting to consider the suffering of our Lord. So we're going to come back to these in just a moment. Um, but what I want us to do is, is first look at this thread of words that Paul is going to utilize in his writing in Ephesians. And what you're going to see is, we were once this, but now we are this. And that's kind of following our theme. So the first uh, phrasing that we see here, uh, again, picking up in chapter 4 and verse 22, is Paul says, to lay aside in reference to your former conduct, the old man, which is being corrupted in, in accordance with the lust of deceit, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and to put on the new man, which is in the likeness of God, uh, that you have been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, uh, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one body. Be angry, and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Why? Verse 27. Because don't give the devil an opportunity. And I think surrounding that verse in chapter 4, verse 27, these things give Satan an opportunity to creep in. And we're going to look at Satan's methods later in chapter 5. But that's in part one reason, is to not be led away. Verse 28 is where we find our first thread, is he who steals must not steal any longer, but rather he must labor performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Okay, so when we look at chapter 4 and verse 28, what does Paul say not to do? Don't steal. But he doesn't leave it there. What are you supposed to do instead? Labor. <laughs> That's right. Yep, I think all of these could hit the evening news. Rather, labor. So Paul is going to talk about this a little bit later also, and, and especially in, in Colossians chapter 3, he's going to touch on how servants are to work and um, we're going to see one of the relationships that we have in, in Ephesians is uh, slaves or servants, um, that they are to work for God and not to work for man. But Paul is saying, especially to the Galatian people, you're not to steal anymore. So there was obviously something going on. Now, if we were to take a poll of this room, how many, have you st or how many of you have stolen in the last week? Maybe a couple hands, stealing a pen from the bank or whatever, I don't know. But that's probably not one of the most prominent sins that we struggle with, Right? Um, now it is a sin that pops up, but I think stealing can come by way of different avenues in life and maybe discreetly stealing, um, whether that's copyrights or plagiarism or anything else. I think a lot of things can fit under the theft. And so what shows us is that when we are inclined or persuaded or uh, tempted to steal, it's a work ethic problem. It means that we're not willing to put in the labor. Now Leif, I'll touch on this for a little bit and hopefully I won't embarrass him too much. Week two of school, and we always tell guys, when you come to school, Satan's going to try everything in his willpower to get you to be discouraged and to get you to leave. That's just part of it. These guys are here to train in the gospel and to go into the world and to spread the gospel. What is the one thing that Satan hates? When people are converted. Well, so there are many times of discouragement and people who are acting as children of disobedience or children of wrath uh, do silly things. And so... Uh, Leif came up to me and he said, hey, someone tried to cut off my catalytic converter. So I went out to his car and sure enough, there were two cut marks in it. So we just went and got some wrap, wrapped it up, put some hose clamps on it, figured good as new. Well, the next night they came back and finished the job. And so Leif was sounding like Monster Jam coming all the way down to the church building uh, in his Honda Element. 
Well, they stole a catalytic converter. By the way, they have special elements in there, and uh, those elements they can take to a scrap yard and get like 80 bucks for them, which is ridiculous. It's not that much money. But if they were to spend that much time and energy into working, they would probably feel some sort of satisfaction and, and probably do good for humanity. And so stealing is one of those problems that, while at first glance seems like a silly sin, I don't steal, but really there's an internal problem here, and it's that you are not willing to go through the efforts of working. And notice what he says in verse 28. He says, uh, he must labor performing with his own hands what is good so that he will have something to share with one who has need. And so Paul is saying, don't be the source of a problem, but be part of the solution. And I think our world needs to hear that a little bit more, and I think maybe we need to hear that a little bit more, that we shouldn't be ones who are inclined to be a problem, but be one who offers solutions. Okay, so the next thread that we see is not very far after. It's verse 29. He says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for building up what is needed so that it will give grace to those who hear. So Paul says what? Don't do what? Don't have any unwholesome talk. Don't, yeah. Don't talk bad. Kind of simplified. And then... What are you supposed to do instead of talking bad or, or having unwholesome talk? Rather, build up or edify. Excellent. Sometimes we, we limit what bad language is, right? We go to a movie, there's lots of bad language, we decide we're not going to sit there and watch it, and so we leave. We go out to the grocery mall or, or wherever and we hear, not grocery mall, that's weird. We go to the grocery store or the mall and we hear people using bad language left and right. We go to school, we hear bad language. We go to work, we hear bad language. But I think bad language can be, can be broadened a little bit more. And Paul, I don't think he had necessarily cuss words in mind, though that is some of it. But what is the inference? If you're not building up, what are you doing? You're tearing down. So a word that tears someone down is just as equal or just as unwholesome as anything else that you can say or anything else that you see in the movies. And sometimes those words that tear down have more of an impact on someone's life than you going to a grocery store and hearing someone use uh, bad language. And so sometimes we need to, to open our minds to think, okay, I'm going to be mean and ugly toward this person. Paul told me not to. And rather, instead of speaking down to a brother or a sister, I'm supposed to speak up, to build them up, to encourage them. And so that's one thing that we need to do, and I think it also ties in in verse 26, be angry, yet do not sin. Sometimes our anger gets the best of our tongue, and it burns down the forest. Sometimes our anger, through our words, can just light something on fire, and then once it's on fire, we have a hard time putting it out or coming back from it. I'll tell a quick story. Um, I think it was Brett Carter. Dennis could probably tell you a little bit more of it, but um, Brett Carter tells a story of he and his family while growing up. Oh, it was Jack Carter and one of his sons. Uh, Jack Carter, that's a name that's familiar in Colorado. One of his sons got angry at his brother, and so he called him, you octagon, and so Jack punished him. Now, is octagon a bad word? No. Um, in the mind of a five-year-old, though, he was trying to come up with something that would tear him down. And so while octagon itself is not a bad or evil word, it's something that he was trying, he was aiming to knock someone down or to tear someone down. And so Paul is saying, don't let unwholesome words proceed from your mouth. And sometimes we leave it there and say, oh, we're not supposed to use bad language. Well, included in that bad language is discouragement. It's things that will tear people down and discourage them. And Paul says, instead of doing that, maybe you should try building someone up. Well, this is so much easier, Paul. I know. This one takes more work. Well, look at the previous one. It's easier to steal. It's easier to walk into Walmart, grab something that's not mine, put it in my pocket, and walk out. But it's harder to go to a job to clock in and to have authority over me. And I think we'll see that as we kind of go through the rest of these. Verse 30, he says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and anger and wrath and shouting and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Again, those unwholesome words. And so by you doing this, what God is doing is he's watching his creation, his people, what he put into motion, and he's watching them tear each other down. 
if you read the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain, um, you'll see that one of the main threads is to treat others fairly, to be considerate of the people that are around you, that you are to represent yourself in a way that people can see God and not to see someone who is filled with wrath or filled with envy or strife, but that you are to take care of one another. And I think part of that is God is watching his family try and take care of each other. And so as any good parent does, he, he revels in uh, watching his children succeed and take care of each other, but he also, he's also uh, discouraged when he sees his children uh, tear each other down. Verse 32, he says, Instead, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, graciously forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also graciously forgiven you. So this one's a little bit more tricky, but if you look at the verses 31, 30, and 32, I should have done that in order, 30, 31, and 32, what is Paul saying not to do? Okay, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. The reason you grieve the Holy Spirit is that you're taking the Holy Spirit, if you believe in the person who is dwelling the Holy Spirit, you're taking the Holy Spirit into that nasty movie, you're taking the Holy Spirit into that situation, you're taking the Holy Spirit, you're mouthing something, the Holy Spirit is, has no recourse but to grieve over what you are doing because the Holy Spirit is within you. Yeah, and so what that really comes down to, we can summarize all of those things by ugly actions. Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 27 says that we are created in the image of God. Colossians chapter 3, verse 11 also talks about that attribution to God. And um, again, I'm going to try not to get too academic, but in the scholarly world, there's a, a split divide of are we physically created in the image of God or are we morally created in the Im image of God? Without going too deep into that, regardless, we are bearing the image of God. And if we are going, uh, if we are giving ourselves over to the lust of sin and giving ourselves over to Satan's ways and Satan's methods, guess what we're doing to the image of God? We're skewing it. We're destroying it. We're, we're filthying it. And so the spirit of God, the, the personal spirit of God as he dwells within us is grieving because... We are doing such things. We're, we're acting ugly toward one another. And so that is a means of grieving the spirit. But instead of that, what does Paul say? Kind, tender, and forgiving. Is that easy? Is it easy to forgive someone? That's tricky. When I was in middle school and high school, I didn't really have any kind of forgiveness to really give to anyone. I mean, we just acted like we did, and then that was that, and you just kind of went on with life. But as you get into adulthood, there are things that people do that are ugly towards you, and it's easy to hold that anger against them. It's easy to maybe say something that might tear them down and get back at them. But Paul says, forgive. And then he also says to be tender and to be kind toward one another. If we can embody those personalities within us, embody those attributes within us, then we are able to what? The spirit. Maybe give the spirit gladness. Maybe give the spirit uh, an inclination of encouragement toward how we are living. Okay, so moving on. Chapter 5 and verse 1, I think it's a pinnacle uh, in Paul's letter to the Ephesus or to the Ephesian church. Uh, he says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Um, that's it. That's all there is to it, right? If you were to, to boil all of this down, it's just copy God. You saw God in the flesh as Jesus Christ, so just copy him. Just do his actions. Yeah, Pam? Mm -hmm. All kinds of things. But if you follow the instruction, you'll be healthier and happier. Yeah, so absolutely. Yep, and that's, that's one of the arguments um, in the apologetic realm is if you were to take even God out of the equation of the Bible, that the Christian life is still the best Christian or that's the best way of living there is because you're generous. And if you're a generous person, guess what that means? That people are going to take a liking to you, that you're going to have friends. And if you're kind and forgiving and tender toward one another, that increases your chances of people spending some more time with you. Yeah. 
Um, if you are one who is constantly building up and edifying, if you are one who is constantly uh, a hard worker, then that shows a lot of great attributes of your life. And I think to Pam, your point, it builds and develops a happiness within us. And it also develops a better quality of life uh, that we can have. And health. And health, yep. Verse 2, he says, and walk in love. Now, walk is also one of those threads that we could have very easily picked out of the book of Ephesians and walked through. And um, maybe some of the instructors will say, that's what you should have done, Tyler. I know. Um, but he says, walk in love just as Christ also loved us and gave himself up for us. And an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. And then he goes on to talk about more uh, inappropriate or wrong ways of living. He says, but sexual immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints, nor filthiness or foolish talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. So what does Paul say? Get rid of the what in your life? This one's kind of tricky, too. I'm just going to kind of summarize impurity. And fill that impurity with what? Get rid of the impurity and supplement it with thanksgiving. Now, that kind of seems strange. All these really correlate well. It's almost the, the necessary inference. Give thanks toward what, though? Just be happy and thankful that you're alive? Well, keep the context of, of Ephesians. Look at chapter 5 and verse 2. He says that you are to love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Can you be thankful that Jesus gave himself up for you? Look at chapter 5 and verse 1. That you are to imitate God as what? Beloved children. That you have a spiritual father. Um, I have several friends who did not have a father figure growing up, whether he was uh, physically absent or psychologically absent. Um, and that's, that's devastating. There are many polls and, and many studies that show how important a father figure is in a household. But I argue it's more important to have a spiritual father in the household. That when God is our father is present in our life and when we are considered his children and acting as his children, bearing his image and, and walking through this life as his children, then there are so many blessings that come from it. Don't believe me? Reread chapter 1 and, and look at all those spiritual blessings that come from Christ through the Father. Um, and so I think thanksgiving can come into that uh, aspect of be thankful for the spirituality that you have. Be thankful that you don't have to live this way anymore. Some people are so caught up in living these different ways, sexual immorality, impurity, greed, filthiness, foolish talk, coarse jesting. And you know what? Those things don't make you feel good. I don't care who you are. There's an objective moral compass, and when you're taking place in those things, you don't feel good at the end of the day. Maybe in the moment it feels good, but at the end of the day, you don't feel good. And Jesus has taken you out of those things and brought you into a spiritual state of peace with God, and that's what feels good. That's what harmonizes with our souls. And so that is a reason to give thanks. He says in verse 5, For this you know with certainty that no one sexually immoral or impure or greedy who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So what are you to be thankful for? That you've got an inheritance. That you've got something waiting for you. That all of this is about to go away and that will be much better in the life to come. He says in verse 6, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers of them. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Again, there's one of those words of walk. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And do not participate in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. And so here we have another contrast. What does Paul say not to do? Don't walk in darkness. Rather, you are to what? Walk as children, but according to that specific verse, he says, expose it. Yeah. Let it be seen. Because when you see it for what it is, it becomes a lot uglier. I think one of Satan's best tactics is to make sin look good. 
And that's how we fish, right? I'm not a fisherman. Um, I am horrible at fishing, which is hilarious because when I asked Natalie to marry me, I said, hey, why don't we go up fishing? I had no clue what to say. Just go up to the mountains and she bought it. Well, I am a terrible fisherman, um, but I've fished before and I know some of the ins and outs of fishing. And what you do is you try and get that bait to look as good as possible for those fish. You try and get the freshest worms or, or whatever, get those shiny colors and get that bait in the water to make it look as good as you want it to look for. And maybe some of you fishermen are saying, you are so silly, you don't know what you're talking about. But Satan makes that bait look great. And then once you bite onto it, you realize you're hooked and your heart starts pounding and you realize, I've messed up, I took the bait. When we expose the darkness, when we lift the cover off of it or shine our light on it, it's exposed for exactly what it is. There is nothing good about sin. When you read the, the news headlines and so many people are abandoning the news and getting rid of it off of their feeds, why? Because it's covered in sin. When you look at the news, you see killings, you see stabbings, you see drunk driving, you see everything in between, uh, whether it's violence or impurity or whatever. But when you shine a light on it, it no longer looks any good. It doesn't look like something I want to be engaged in. And so Paul is saying, don't participate in the unfruitful works of uh, darkness. And notice how he says unfruitful works, as if he's trying to build us up more. <laughs> They're not just works of darkness. They don't amount to anything. You can't have any good come out of those works. They're unfruitful. But instead, expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light for everything that has become visible in the light. For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Well, again, keep in context some of these things. It's not just sin, but maybe it's someone promoting sin as some sort of religion or ideology, right? He's talked already several times about truth and walking in truth and spreading truth and, and having this truth in our lives. And so there are times where, especially in the original historical context of Ephesus, that these people were, were covering up sin as, as righteousness. They were making these things out to be religious, um, that you could participate this and be religious, that you could have a, uh, an understanding or a communion with God. Well, it's funny. I've studied nihilism for a little bit, and nihilism is basically just being happy with that you are nothing more than an animal or a creature or a summation of atoms and molecules, and that at the end of the days you'll die, and that's it. That's nihilism. It's like a happy atheist. Uh, most, most atheists are not happy. They're very militant and hostile. But nihilism tries to add a sense of spirituality to atheism and say, it's okay, we're just going to die and that's that. There are religions out there that are so far off base that they will try and grab you into some sort of religious conundrum that sounds good, but in the end it's darkness and it's sinful and it's unfruitful. Um, if you want to go real deep into it, you can look up what pagan worship was for the first century. It's awful and very impure. And so you can see why Paul is hitting on these words like impure and getting rid of them. But expose them for what they are. All right, verse 15, he says, Therefore look carefully at how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. On account of this, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So the last really contrast that we see here in this section of Scripture, what does he say not to do? Don't get drunk, but rather do what? Be filled with the Spirit. Now, kind of jumping ship from Ephesians for a little bit, but if you go to Galatians, you've got the fruit of the Spirit, right? And all those things. When you're filled with the Spirit, you've got everything working for you toward God. You've got labor. You've got good work ethic when you're being filled with the Spirit. You've got edification coming from your lips. You're kind, you're tender, you're forgiving. You're giving thanks to God for redeeming you and for bringing you into that kingdom. You're exposing the things in the light. When you are walking in the Spirit, you are pure. You're being righteous and you have this new way of living 
and it kind of brings us back to chapter 5 and verse 1. Be imitators of God as his children. Well, one of the ways that we can imitate God is to be filled with his spirit. And by drunkenness, that gets rid of that spirit. It gets rid of God um, and his image on us. We start acting like someone else. We start becoming someone else. We start uh, consuming our lives with other things. Verse 19, he says, Speaking another, to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for the, all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. So Paul gives a list here, and he gives a list in Galatians about what it means to be filled with the Spirit. When you're not filled with wine, and when you're not drunk, and when you're not intoxicated, um, and I, I think that there are other ways of becoming intoxicated, I think you can be drunk with anger. I think you can be drunk with sleep deprivation. I think you can be drunk with lust. But he says, when you're not drunk with wine, when you're filled with the Spirit, you are active and engaged in singing to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You are making melody with your heart to the Lord. You are giving thanks, again, second time that we see that here in this pericope, for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, even the Father, and being subject to one another in the fear of Christ. All right, so that's, that's kind of that first section that I wanted to walk through. And this second section will take us through the end of the book of Ephesians. Um, and here we see in chapter 4 and verse 32, kind of switching gears a little bit to follow this thread. And the thread here, starting off, is uh, this idea of allowing Jesus to be the new standard. As I live, I realize that standards are varied by uh, experience and knowledge. Now, let me explain that for a little bit. Um, when you have a standard in your mind and you have a new experience or a new blessing or revelation of knowledge, then that standard is going to change. For instance, I had my first job as a delivery driver for Perry's Pizza. Still eat at Perry's Pizza, still love it. Um, and it was a great job. But then my second job was a fabrication welder in Duncan, Oklahoma, where I worked much different hours. As a pizza delivery guy, I worked weekends, Friday to Saturday from 6 p.m. until 10 p.m. And that was it. That was my work week. And then I went to school. Uh, in Duncan, Oklahoma, I was in a shop ran by a maniac, and he was relentless in his work ethic. He was a workaholic to every definition. Um, it's where I worked my first 21-hour day. That was not favorable, but that's what it was. Well, my standard of what it meant to be a good worker was then varied by experience or knowledge. I thought I knew the standard of scripture and, and how to obey it uh, in high school, and then I graduated high school. Uh, I went through my uh, kind of dark years and then came back to it, studied at Bear Valley, and now that standard of how to follow scripture was elevated. I had a new standard of scripture and how to study scripture um, because of experience and knowledge given to me. Uh, you could probably relate with your first car. You probably have fond memories or maybe not so fond memories of your first car. But when you got your second car and had a little bit more money to save up, that standard got elevated because of knowledge or experience, or got lowered because of knowledge and experience. <laughs> but the same is with Jesus. When we know Jesus and when we experience Jesus, our standard of living becomes elevated. Right? If there are people who do not know Jesus, their standard of living is pretty primitive, pretty basic. Um, they're able to do all sorts of different things. But when you have Jesus, your standard of living and morality and ethics and how to be righteous toward God, that standard raises because now you have an experience and you have a knowledge that is rooted in Christ. And that's what this next thread is going to do is talk about these different areas in life. Again, Paul is being very practical in how to uh, communicate his message. But in chapter 4 and verse 32, that's where we're going to see our first uh, phrase of just as Christ. And that's going to be the phrase that we chase through the rest of this text. He says in verse 32, be kind to one another and tenderhearted, graciously forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also graciously forgiven you. So we have a new standard in how we are to treat others or a general approach to other people. So that's kind of a general uh, standard that we're raising, especially in forgiveness, I think, in verse 32. Notice how he set the standard, not as I've forgiven you, or not as your fellow man has forgiven you, but the standard has been elevated to just as God in Christ has also graciously forgiven you. 
Uh, and again, we have our list over here from being kind to one another, to be tender-hearted, to be gracious in forgiveness. All right, we don't have to go very far to see the next uh, just as Christ statement. In chapter 5 and verse 2, he says, Walk in love just as Christ has also loved us and gave himself up for us. So in chapter 5, verse 2, sorry, that's 5-1, five, 5-2, five, he says that you are to raise the standard of love. Now, when you look at Jesus and how he loved, it was imperative that he would communicate truth and he would not sacrifice truth or righteousness for uh, free will or how you want to live. Our society has completely hijacked the word love and has taken it to mean uh, basically a subjective meaning to anyone and anywhere. Uh, but really what love is, is giving oneself up for one another. And so, guess what? If we love Christ, guess what we're going to do for Christ? We're going to pick up our cross and follow Him. And so that's our new standard of love, not only toward Christ, but also toward everyone else. That we are to be selfless in how we walk toward one another. All right, when you jump to chapter 5 and verse 22, you see another as to the Lord. He says, wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. In verse 23, he would say, for the husband is the house, uh, or the husband is not the house. He is the head of the wife as Christ is also the head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body. And then in verse 24, he says, but as church is subject to Christ, uh, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands and everything. Now, husbands often like to stop it right there and say, oh yeah, we're the head of the household and our wives should be submissive to us. But then our standard of marital relationship has been risen too. Look at verse 25. He says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands ought to be willing to give everything for their wives. Um, not only speaking kindly and to being thankful and to be kind and tender and forgiving and all those things, but husbands now have this new standard that is contrary to what the world has proposed and brought out and everything else. But a husband is to be completely selfless, to be the epitome of what Christ did for us. Because look at what Christ did for the church, giving himself up for her. When you jump to chapter uh, 5 and verse 29, he says, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. Uh, speaking in context still of husbands, husbands get a little bit longer of a chunk if you uh, notice that. The wives, it's pretty simple, but he knew that the husbands needed a little bit more instruction uh, and gentleness. So, in chapter 5, 22, 23, 24, 25, and also 29, we have a new standard of what marriage looks like. Marriage is not disposable. Marriage is not hateful or uh, revengeful. Uh, marriage is not one that is built on foundations of lies or anything else, but marriage is one where the, the wives are to submit to the husbands as to the Lord, right? That's that new standard. And then for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is also, that's the new standard. But then husbands are supposed to reciprocate that and be loving and selfless toward their wives. All right, chapter 6, and verse 1, we have another phrase of this. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. Exodus chapter 20, and verse 12, we talk about that. So this is a command on how children are supposed to conduct themselves. Um, notice how Jesus conducted himself as a child or as a son of God. He was obedient and submissive to the Father even when it, when it went against his uh, desires of not drinking the cup in Gethsemane. Uh, verse 4, he says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Okay, so we have uh, parents, namely fathers, how they are to uh, conduct themselves toward the children. When you look at God the Father, you get a pretty awesome template of what it means to be a father. When you look at Hebrews chapter 12, you see that there's sometimes discipline involved. Um, that it's not always the fun father. Uh, when you look at 6, you have slaves or servants. Well, that's been abolished since 1865. But what about workers? Uh, you still have that attribute. Uh, chapter 6 and verse 7, he says, Serving with goodwill as to the Father and not to men, knowing uh, that whatever good thing has been given 
um, that each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. Uh, chapter 6 and verse 9, we see that there is a new standard for masters or owners or bosses. Again, not necessarily slavery in our context. It was their slave were, slaves were a very prominent thing. And then finally, in chapter 6 and verse 10, he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the might of his strength. And he would talk about the full armor of God. And so be strong as Jesus was strong, uh, because you have him and you are in him. All right, in a nutshell, that's Ephesians, at least for this class sake. Again, there is so much more that we could go through. I could have devoted the entire quarter to Ephesians. But I think this gives us a decent grasp on this. Now, there are a couple uh, on this list. I told us that we'd get back to this. There are a couple on this list that we can't do. We can't be <laughs> Lord over someone. Please don't do that. Um, we are not the Christ. There's only one Christ. But we can show compassion. We can't be omnipotent. But we can be personal. Um, we can be trustworthy. We can share that truth. We can be a brother to someone. We can be selfless. We can help others get redeemed. We can be a servant. We can teach others. We ourselves can be holy. Uh, we can be relatable. We can love. We can conduct ourselves in blamelessness. We can be humble, and we can also suffer for the sake of Christ. And that's where Paul is writing as a prisoner of God. So Paul in Ephesians really talks about what it means to put off the old self, put on the new self, what that looks like, and why it looks the way it does. And it's all because of the gospel and the spiritual blessings that we have in God. Uh, namely, um, his spirit residing with us as his temple. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to hand it over to Wes and Jack.